pursuit. Fresh Start Church is in pursuit. Amen? Uh, The word pursuit means to crave, to go after intensely, to seek for with persistence, to sacrifice other things for, to require as a necessity. We are in pursuit. We are not playing. We are pursuing. Y'all help me finish that. We, we, we are not playing. We are. Yes, we are. This is our year of pursuit. Pursuit of his presence. That we might have more of him in our lives. Pursuit of his character. That we might be more like him. Pursuit of his harvest, uh, to share the gospel in your world. Pursuit of his dreams, because his plans are greater than we could ever imagine. This is what we are pursuing this year. And what we are learning, that in our pursuit of God's presence, we gain the seed of his character. We gain a heart for his harvest. And we gain the reality of his dreams in our life. So really, pursuit is not a theme this year. Pursuit is a journey. It begins with us pursuing his presence. And that's why Pastor Kim and I are taking our time and and just working on his presence for a while. Because if we miss his presence, we miss everything else. But if we can pursue his presence, if we uh, can allow the Holy Spirit to create within us a great passion for him and him alone. Uh, You know, it's very easy when we have been in church for a while, and that's why I I so press against the spirit of religion, because it is so easy to become religious. And it is so easy even in ministry to become professional. I become a professional preacher. Y'all become professional Christians, churchgoers. You know what I'm talking about? And so, so, so we, we cry out for the Holy Spirit as a preacher. You say, Holy Spirit, I need you to anoint me. Holy Spirit, I need you to help me. Holy Spirit, will you come to church today? Holy Spirit, will you come and do signs, wonders, and miracles? And Holy Spirit, will you come and do wonderful things in the church? And, 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 and that's okay. But if that's the only time we seek him, then we have become professional because we want him to help us succeed. Uh, y'all hear what I'm talking about? And so if the only time we seek the Holy Spirit is about church and when we come, he, he's bigger than that. He's broader than that. The Holy Spirit is our helper. He is our comforter. He is our best friend. Uh, we don't want to be professional driven. We want to be presence driven. And so a lot of churches, everything in church is built around a professional, a religious concept that make people and ministers feel comfortable about what's going on in church, but they're not really pursuing his presence. We want the person of the Holy Spirit, but we don't want the personality of the Holy Spirit. You see, personality, that's when he shows up and does what he does. His personality, who he is, how he works among us. And so but here at Fresh Start Church, we are in pursuit of his presence. We talked about this a little bit last week. I want to kind of pick up where we left off and, and uh, because I, I believe when we get to the end today, that's why I didn't do an altar call uh, because I'm going to do one at the end today because God's going to release power in this place. I, I, I just heard uh, Corey's back there somewhere, and I heard C- the Holy Spirit's touching Corey. And Corey, you just, you just sit there, and you let the Holy Spirit touch you, bro, because I'm, I'm going to tell you something. When we get to the end of this service, the power of God is getting ready to rock you so hard, man. He's, he's back there. He's back there right now. God's on him, man. You're Corey. You know what I'm talking about? He's back there right now. The Holy Ghost is all over him. I can see him back there. He's shaking right now. We're going to get to the end of this thing, and there's going to be power released in this place. You watch, you watch, you watch, you watch, you watch. Uh, Because we are pursuing his presence. And when you pursue his presence, eventually uh, it will lead you into a deeper spiritual experience with Jesus through the person of the Holy Spirit. I've got to say this because, look, our Bible tells us uh, that there are three types of people. uh, Talked about in the the scripture, there are those that's called the natural person. Uh, Natural people are people that have not received Jesus Christ yet. And so their whole world is in a natural 
realm. Because they have not received Christ as their Savior, they have not been made alive to him. So therefore, the things of God doesn't make any sense. They're they're not going to pursue it because they don't understand it, and it makes no sense to them. All right? That's where we all were until by faith we reached out and received Jesus, and we were born again. Yes. We didn't become become religious. We became born again children of God. Yes. And so a relationship then began, and then we moved from being uh, natural to carnal. The Bible talks about carnal people. Uh, Carnal people are people who have been born again, who have received Jesus Christ, but yet they have very little understanding of the ways of the Spirit. So they, even though they have received Christ, they, the Bible calls them a carnal believer. Because, but because they have received Christ, but they have not pursued him, then even though they are saved, they still live most of their life in the natural. And so when you look at a, a natural person who has, has not received Christ, and the Spirit of God is not alive in them, and then you look at a carnal believer or a carnal person, sometimes you scratch your head and you say, I really can't tell much difference. Uh, the only difference is the carnal person has received Christ, so they're saved, and when they die, they go to heaven. But there's very little difference in how they, in their, spiritual le- in their level of spiritual experience. Are y'all with me? And so therefore, their life is spent much simply in the natural realm, in the realm, waiting either to die or for Jesus to come and take us home, all right? And then the Bible talks about the spiritual person. Yes, that's who I come to to talk to uh, this morning. Uh, It's the spiritual, well, actually, I come to talk to the carnal one, uh, but but I'm going to talk to the spiritual one, but but I'm going to talk to the carnal one, but I'm going to talk to the spiritual one. I'm also going to talk to the natural one, because if you're natural here today, in a moment, I can take you, I can can give you a quantum leap from the natural to the spiritual. Yeah, yeah. And so, and so, uh, and so, the spiritual one is, is is one that's been born again, has received Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior, has applied themselves, have been in pursuit of spiritual things, have been in pursuit of understanding uh, of God and the knowledge of God, not just the Word of God, but through the Word of God, gaining knowledge of God. Uh, so I just don't know about Him, but I know Him. Yes, and so. Uh, th- this is what I'm on a mission to do today. And as we uh, here at Fresh Start Church know, absolutely, in this room right now, there's some natural folks. In this room right now, there's some carnal folks. And in this room right now, I know there are some spiritual folks. And when you begin to pursue his presence, sooner or later, you're going to have an, a spiritual experience that's going to move you into a whole nother level of understanding and relationship. And this begins with the person of the Holy Spirit. It really begins what we talked about last week, that Acts 2 experience. Y'all remember that? Let me do this real quickly. Uh, we'll go back to Luke uh, chapter 24, verse 49. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Then we'll just, just move right over to Acts, Acts uh, chapter 1. And uh, let's see, verse uh, f- verse 4 and 5. Uh, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but wait. Everybody say, wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days uh, from now. And then Acts 2, just got, let's just read this, and then we're going to preach on. Acts 2, verse 1, and when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all uh, with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven and a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole room where they were sitting, and there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, as one who sat up on them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave uh, them utterance. So here is the Acts 2 experience. 120 were gathered in an upper room. They were pursuing one thing, more of Jesus. The reason they were pursuing more of Jesus, and even though that they had they had this amazing relationship, and they they had uh, an authentic experience with Jesus, but Jesus had already told them, "There's more. There's more. There's more to this thing than just being saved." 
There's more to this thing than just going to heaven when you die. There's more to this thing, and, and, and the way that you receive the more is you have to tarry, is you have to wait uh, in uh, Jerusalem. Now, when you first look at that, it, 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 it says to us that we have to get into a passive posture. But he's not telling us to be passive. Uh, the, the word tarry and the word wait uh, really is a balanced pursuit. It means that we are, pers- we, are, we are in pursuit of more, but while we are in pursuit of more, we are waiting in worship with an expectation that any moment the heavens are going to open up. And there is going to be a saturation point. And there's going to be a poured out glory. And there's going to be a flash point. And there's going to be falling fire. And there's going to be a release point. And there's going to be a river rising. And there's going to be a Holy Spirit experience that lifts us to a whole nother level in God. Jesus talked about it in John 7. Watch, i got to do this. John 7, he said, on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, if anyone thirsts, anybody thirsty in this room, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, out of his heart, the core of his being, his spirit, his soul, his body, his spirit and his soul, his mind, his will, uh, his emotions, out of that will flow rivers, not, not singular, remember, it's rivers, rivers of living water. But this is... He spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. We know Jesus told his disciples, he said, look, I I must go away. It's expedient. I must leave because when I leave, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to you. And when he comes, he will be your guide. He will be your counselor. He will be your helper. He will, he, he will call you. He will direct you. He will be your best friend. He, I have been with you, but he will be in you. And, and so they already had received instruction for Jesus. And so what we have to understand is that there is, in, in the born-again child of God and in the spirit-filled, baptized believer, that there is a river. i got to go on this. There is a river within us, and that river flows. It's not a stagnant stream. It's not a blocked up stream. It's not a water that I carry around on the inside of me that's just in me, but it is a river that flow out of his belly will flow rivers, and it is a river that cannot be contained. It is a never ending, it is a never drying river. It is the Spirit of God, it is the life of God on the inside of us. And the question I have to present to us this morning is how long has it been uh, since the river has flowed out of you in power? This is the question I want to address this morning. How long has it been since the river has flowed out of you in power? I've come to talk about power. Jesus said, wait until you are endued with power. Then he said, after the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you shall receive power power. This is what I've come to talk about. And I believe this is the reason that Paul commands us in Ephesians 5.18, be filled with the Spirit. Be filled. That's a command, not an option. This would be a good idea. No, Paul, under the apostolic authority, stands and commands that we be filled with the Spirit. We understand the phrase, filled with the Spirit, present tense, in that it's not a one-time experience, but it is an experience that can happen in our life, moment after moment after moment after moment, uh, that we can be filled with the Spirit. It is an uncontainable force. Now, and the reason I believe he commands this to us is because unless there is something within us that continues to supply what we need, we, we, we become dry. We dry up. Ever been in any dry, dry churches, Pastor Jack? Ever had to preach to any dry people? Huh? You see, I, say, I, say, I, I, I want you to understand something. This is why I'm preaching on this and pushing on this. is because even after we, oh, we, some of us experienced last week, and there was a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Many received for the first time. Many received that, that, that fresh baptism in the Holy Spirit. But you know what? If you have not kept the river flowing, 
I guarantee you, you already dry in your spirit. And you're saying, that must not have been real. What was that all about? You see why? Because we have to understand that we have a responsibility to keep the river flowing. Yes, and that, that's the whole speaking in the heavenly language thing, that when, I, when our heart gets filled, it's got to be expressed out of our mouth, and we receive our heavenly language, and when we release that heavenly language, it causes the river to move from the inside to the outside. Are y'all hearing me? Creating around us a spiritual environment and a spiritual atmosphere that causes us to rise up in power. Oh, this is so good. You see, when we get dry, eventually we die spiritually. And when we die spiritually, we lose our joy. There should be no sad people in this house. We lose our power. We lose our anointing. We lose our peace. We lose. Because we dry up. And then what happens is our spiritual experience at that moment, our whole life becomes this endurance test. How much can I endure? The Lord only knows. Lord, how much can I take? I know you know. You wouldn't put it on me if I couldn't bear it. This is true. But that's not the way we're supposed to live. And see, when you don't have the spiritual life flowing, see, I know what it is to be dry. I know what it is to have to get up and preach dry. You know what I'm talking about, Dr. Joe? I know what it is to pray over people and feel dry. I'm confessing my sin before you because I I don't have to be dry. If I learn how to get under the spout, old church, where the glory comes out, if I learn to be with Jesus before I go be with people, if I learn how to release in my faith, the spirit of God that is within me. Are y'all hearing me right? I'm trying to help somebody. Uh, because life becomes this endurance. Can I endure to the end? Understand, this is not God's intention. Our life uh, is not to be endured. Our life is to be endued with power from on high. That we might live in power. Are y'all getting this? Oh, yes. Because somebody's getting ready to shift in this place uh, this morning. And so when I was thinking about this, I have to let you know. That the baptism in the Holy Spirit is not about being perfect. I can't tell you, get filled with the Holy Spirit and you'll be perfect. Not true. Not true. It's not about being perfect. It's about being powerful. Jesus didn't redeem us so we could be perfect. Jesus redeemed us so we could be powerful. Jesus doesn't have a church in the earth, so it's a place where all the perfect people can go. Jesus has got a church, so there's a place for powerful people to be built and raised up. People that refuse to endure life and say, I am endued with power from on high, and I will live life to the fullest. Somebody shout, yeah. See, the power I'm talking about is not a dominating power. This power from on high doesn't come to dominate us. It comes to elevate us. Yes. Everybody shout powerful people. I'm very passionate about powerful people because I believe that this is something that God wants to do in in Fresh Start Churches. He wants to raise up powerful people. You do know desperate times demand powerful people to stand up and be heard. And so I'm on this quest with the help of the Holy Spirit to become a powerful person and to raise up a powerful people. Powerful people refuse to be crushed by the circumstances of life. Powerful people uh, refuse to be deterred by the opinions of experts that crush their dreams. Tell them they don't, they're not adequate. Tell them they don't have the skill level to get there. Uh, th- those people that always tend to tear you down and speak negativity over your life. Uh, I, I, I don't have time to listen to them anymore. I, I don't care about their opinions anymore. I'm a powerful person. I will rise and I will dream. I will become. You will. You are powerful. Powerful people won't wallow in self pity. The days are over that they have to deal with petty people. Don't got time for petty people. 
petty if you want to be. I choose power over petty. Come on, somebody. Instead, they have decided, powerful people have decided to use their value to rescue cities. A fly. Beelzebub. The Lord of the flies. He must be upset because God's getting ready to raise up some powerful people in this place. I just come to tell you today you're born to win. I come to tell you today you're equipped to shape nations. I come to tell you today that you are empowered uh, to extend the kingdom of God. I come to tell you you are ready to extend the love of God to a desperate, broken world. I have come to tell you you have a mandate on your life. You have a mission. You are powerful. Oh, though it may get hard, though the burdens may be get heavy, though it may be, look like some days you are losing and you can't get in front. I had just come to tell you, no matter how far behind it may seem like you are today, God can shift it in a moment. God can loose his power. God can make the giant come down, make the walls come down. God can do it. He can split a sea if he's got to. Somebody shout Yes. I'm moving on something because there's going to be some power released in this place. Powerful people. Ah, Powerful people aren't whiners. They're winners. They're not wimps. They're warriors. They're not succumbers. They're overcomers. They're not losers. They're leaders. I'm talking about powerful people. They're not takers. They're givers. They're not just dreamers. They're achievers. I just come to tell you we're powerful today. We are not just survivors. We are thrivers. We are powerful. So this is where we move. Like I talked about last week, this is where we move from the initial evidence to the substantial evidence. Watch, watch. So this is where we go from the actual experience of the baptism of the Holy Spirit where we receive our heavenly language. And we move into this substantial evidence, which we have a generation that's hungry for the power and, 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 and true spiritual experience in the Holy Spirit. But the evidence is not enough for them. There has to be something substantial with this thing. So, I, so okay, I got my prayer language. What does that mean? And what do I do with it? How does it become substantial? This is what I, what I want to work on because, you see, you have to understand that, that it, it is where our experience, substantial experience is where our experience becomes a life filled with explosive effectiveness. Lord, help me preach this. I got to move on here. But let me, let, me just, let me just get down and just say this. Believers who pray in the Spirit. You say, what do you mean pray in the Spirit? I mean who release their heavenly language in the Spirit. So they didn't just receive a heavenly language at the baptism in the Holy Spirit, but they, they now received it, and now every day in their, in their time with Jesus, they release their heavenly language. And you have to understand that when we release our heavenly language, it creates an atmosphere around us. When people in a gathering like this release their heavenly language, it creates an atmosphere. It creates an atmosphere of exaltation and an atmosphere of edification. I'm going somewhere with this. Uh, it, it, it creates an atmosphere that lifts up, and it creates an atmosphere uh, that builds up. Uh, l- l- let, me, let, me, let me show you uh, what, what I'm talking about. When you talk about exaltation, uh, in Acts 2.11, on the day of Pentecost, when they had received their heavenly language, in Acts 2.11 it said, and we heard them speaking in other tongues. The wonderful works of God. And so they were speaking in a language that was unknown to them. But apparently it was known by the the Cretans and and the, the Arabs. They knew what they were saying. They were speaking in an unknown tongue, but the unknown tongue was speaking wonderful works of God. 1 Corinthians 4, 2 says to us, For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God. For no one understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. I I, I want you to understand this. 
that when you pray in the Holy Spirit, when you release your heavenly language, we don't always know what we are saying, but God does. That's awesome. That is so cool that I can release my heavenly language and you don't know what I'm praying. But you know what? The devil don't know what I'm praying either. The only one that understands is God. Because I'm not speaking to a man. I'm speaking directly to God. I'm passing everything and going to the very ears of God. Somehow God's got an ear to hear when people release a heaven. It's a language not understood in the earthly realm, but it is a language that is understood in the heavenly realm. And when you pray in the spirit, you speak mysteries. Watch, I will work on this. Make, well, I'm going to try to make it make some kind of sense to us, you see. And, and when I was reading over this, and then I came to Acts 33, uh, 233. Watch. Therefore, being exalted. This is Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost after his spiritual experience. Uh, therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this, which is now, you now see it here. So he's talking about the fact, I've had this spiritual experience. God, it is, God has poured out on us. This is what you see. This is what you hear. But look at the first part. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Spirit. This, this is what I want you to understand here. That Peter, I believe, and all those in the upper room, when they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the heavens opened. Now, it doesn't tell us that they saw anything, but I have a feeling somewhere uh, between the experience and Peter preaching, maybe he saw Jesus exalted to the right hand of the Father. I'm talking about exaltation. I'm talking about the fact that when they released their heavenly language, it wasn't about them. It was about Jesus. And it was about the fact that he was exalted and that he was high and that he was lifted. Could it be that the Acts 2 experience will release a throne room worship? Could it be that those in the upper room that day went to a whole nother level of worship that they had never been at before, that through the Spirit of God and through releasing their prayer language, that they moved to a level that was worthy of our King, that they couldn't do with their own mouth, they couldn't do with their own words. Why? Because our mind is too fire night. It, it doesn't grasp the greatness of God. And so sometimes we are incapable to comprehend. And our own language is inadequate to express the worship that he is worthy. Very soon I run out of words when I really get a glimpse of this, that he is more than a risen Savior. He is a ruling sovereign, and he sits on a throne at the right hand of God, and he is worthy of all my praise. Somebody ought to give him about 30 seconds of your best you got to understand, there's a real throne room, and the uncreated God sits on that throne. The Ancient of Days sits on that throne, and he governs and he rules. He sits there in his glory. He sits there in his splendor. Peter got a glimpse of what it looks like in heaven, and he said, hey, I just want to stop, and I want to exalt Jesus Christ. Let us speak of the wondrous works of our God. That was, that was messing me up when I, when, I, when, I, when I understood that. That messed me up. That messed me up. That messed me up because there's a real throne room. It's, not a, it's a literal place in heaven. Peter had a glimpse of it. I want you to know this is the kind of worship, this is the kind of praise God's getting ready to release over his people, his spirit-filled people. You can't, you, can't, you can't get there by just praying with your own understanding of God because we don't understand him fully. Uh, we, we can't get there, like I said, because our words run out way too quickly. But when you have a heavenly language, you can, you can tap into that, and you can release that, and it releases around you a, 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 an anointing that lifts up the name of God, that lifts up the presence of God. Y'all, y'all with me on this? See, this is so good. Let me, let me show you what I'm talking about. Just the scripture will, will, will paint us a picture here in uh, Revelation 5. Revelation 5. Um, 
Yeah. Watch this. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures, the 24 elders, fell down before the lamb, each having the harp, the gold bowls full of incense. He's talking about it looks like in heaven, which were the prayer of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, worthy is the lamb. Worthy are, are, you are worthy uh, to take the scroll and to open its seal, for you were slain. And the redemption, of, and you have the redemp <laughs> oh, Jesus, help me. And you have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe. Watch, a tongue, people. In nation, you have made us kings and priests to our God, uh, and we shall reign where on earth. Then I looked and I heard a voice, many angels uh, around the throne, living creatures and elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands, uh, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth, that's us, and under the earth shall as we uh, and such as are in the sea and all that are in them are heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power being to him who sits on the throne to the Lamb forever and ever. And then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshiped him who lives forever and ever. See, many times when we read these scriptures, we think that's in the future, but I think it's now. I think if you could roll back heaven this morning, that's what you would see going on right now. I, I, I think if we could understand this, that outside of time, the lamb has already been crowned. The lamb that was slain from the foundations of the world, he's already got his crown on. He's already sitting down on his throne. In heaven, it's done. In heaven, it's finished. In heaven, he has triumphed. It's going on right now. So when we gather together in physical buildings, in time and space, are we set in our own time with him in time and space. We, we are in a real way joining with those I just read about here, my friend. And you have to understand that when we come together and we release our worship, that we are joining the activity of heaven. We, we're not down here by ourselves trying to squeak out some little praise. But when we release our praise in the spirit, we are, we are, we are joining the throne room activity of heaven. There is a worship beyond human limitation that we get to participate in right now. We don't have to wait till we get there. We can do it right now because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. I just come to tell you this morning, God's raising up a radical generation of power, passionate worshipers who will unleash a power of another world. When you worship like heaven, heaven comes down. If you want to be in a place of glory, there's got to be some worship that goes beyond our human limitation. Somebody say yes. So Peter had this revelation. It went beyond the risen Savior. It went, it went into the sovereign, the reigning sovereign, the Lord of lords. I'm telling you, I'm ready to be elevated to that level of worship in this house. How about you? So it builds, it builds this atmosphere of exaltation around us. See, praying, praying in the spirit lifts up Jesus. Lifts Jesus up. Please understand, worship is, is, is a lifestyle. It, it, it's, it's not a block of time that we give him on a Sunday morning. Y'all with me? Okay. Everybody say exaltation. Let me move on. Then it's edification. Praying in the spirit edifies. It edifies. It exalts Jesus on his throne. And it, and it edifies Jesus in us. The life of Jesus in us is edified. You see, you see uh, Jude 20 says, But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith. How do you do that? Praying in the Holy Spirit. Again, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, 4, he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. The word edify is in the word edifice. So when, when you pray in the spirit, you are building up something. 
You're building up something. It, it, the term literally because it is edification or edifies is referring to an edifice, which an edifice is a building. So you're building something up. You're building something up. You're building a building. Is, is that clear? I'm just making sure y'all wake out there. You're building a building. G, uh, Paul said again in 1 Corinthians 6, uh, said to us, or do you not know that you are, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own. So he's telling us there that our literal bodies are buildings, temples, play a dwelling place for the Holy Spirit. And so when he says, he that speaks in tongues, those that release their heavenly language, when you're releasing your heavenly language, sometimes you may be in a place of edification and you may be lifting up Jesus who sits on the throne. Other times you may be building up the spirit of God that is in you and you are creating a dwelling place. You're expanding your capacity for more of the Holy Spirit to come and dwell in your life. Are y'all with me with this? You see, this is important because we do have an enemy. And our enemy is at work to tear down what God is intending to build up. Because if there's anything he doesn't want, he doesn't want there to be any believers who have built themselves up in their most holy faith. He doesn't want us to be strong in the spirit. He doesn't mind if we're carnal. He doesn't mind if the spirit in us is little because we only give him a little bit of ourselves. But people that release their heavenly language creates a spiritual capacity within them that they can have more of God's presence around them and in them. Are y'all getting this? And so we have to be careful uh, that we don't quench the spirit, not just as in church, but I don't want to quench the spirit that is on me and in me every day. And so I have to give him room in my life. I have to create a space that he can begin to release the fruit of the spirit. I have to create a space that he can begin to release the gifts of the spirit. I have to build up my spirit on the inside of me through the spirit of God. And so as I am releasing my heavenly language, as I am releasing this tongue, then I am being built up spiritually. And at that very moment, you can count on it, that the enemy will come to tear down the temple, to vandalize the temple. He wants to leave it in ruins. He doesn't want there to be a place for the Shekinah glory to dwell. He doesn't want there to be a place where people know if I can get there, I can find God. He doesn't want there to be a place. See, we are the temple of God. We carry Shekinah glory. There's an ark on the inside of you. There is a fire on the inside of you. And all through the Old Testament, they came in and tore the temple down, stole the presence of God. But God said finally one day when Jesus went to the cross, enough is enough, and he rent the veil in two. It said, my presence won't be in a natural temple anymore, but now I will release my temple into the heart of man, the soul of man. I will release my glory. I don't have to go somewhere and find him. I just got to get down deep on the inside of me. Because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Somebody ought to be happy about it. You see, the Holy Spirit is out to wreck our spiritual capacity. Say, so how do I know my spiritual capacity is wrecked? Because the fruit of the Spirit isn't flowing. The river of the Spirit isn't flowing. Joy isn't flowing. Peace isn't flowing. Long-suffering and patience and, and gentleness and, and all the fruits of the Spirit, they're not flowing through me. I, I, they're, they're not manifesting around my life. I try to be, I try to love people, and I try to be joyful, and I, I try to be patient. I'm trying. To, no, no, no. It's not about trying. It's about the, see, see, this ain't about trying to be something. This is about the Holy Spirit being in us. This is about us being a vessel that contains the very glory and the essence of God. Are y'all with me on that? 
So when you pray in the spirit, God, when you pray in the spirit, uh, we build back up what the enemy has tore down. I would be remiss to tell you that you, you will be able to go through life and never get your temple messed up. All of our temple has been vandalized. All of our temples have been brutalized. All of our temples have faced very difficult things in life that have, that have ripped the faith out of, out, out, out of the core of our being. Y'all with me? All of us, all of us had this temple attacked. And I'm not talking about even the physical. I'm just talking about the fact that this thing, this thing that carries the glory of God, that the enemy has come against it, and he has tried to violate it. He has tried to pollute it. He has tried uh, to cause the temple to become an unworthy place to house the glory of God. But how many know that the blood of Jesus still cleanses? How many know that the blood of Jesus still heals? How many know that the blood of Jesus still restores? How many know no matter how broken, no matter how unclean, no matter how trashed your temple becomes, God will always raise up the ultimate restorer. And his name is Jesus Christ. And he will come in and he will sweep the house clean. He will tell the enemy, that's not yours. I bought it with a price. It's mine. You don't own it. Drug addiction, leave. They're mine. Alcoholism, dream. Sexual perversion, leave. Pain, leave. Abuse, leave. Tragedy, leave. Brokenness, leave. Woundedness, leave. Leave. When we pray in the Holy Spirit, God begins to build up. Yes. That's so good. Okay, let me wrap this up. You know what that means, right? I can do this. I preach on. I'm going to preach on. Something's getting ready to be loosed over this house. We're getting ready to go from the comfort zone to the power zone. Y'all ready? That's my last point. That's my last point. We're moving into the power zone. We're moving into the power zone because, see, when you create around your life an atmosphere of edification and you create around your life an atmosphere of exaltation, then, my friend, you are set. You, 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 you are getting ready uh, to move because your whole life takes a capacity to move into what I'm going to call a quantum leap into the power zone. The power zone is what Jesus was talking about when he said when you receive uh, the Holy Spirit, the, when, when, you are, when you are receive the Holy Spirit, you shall receive power. You shall receive power. Power. Everybody shout power. power. I can do this quickly, but see, this word power is, is quite amazing. The, the power zone has got three levels, or maybe not levels, maybe three components of power that dwell within it. This word power uh, that, that Jesus uses here in Acts 1 8 is the word, Greek word dynamis. It means miracles, miracle force. It means miraculous ability. It means mighty strength, uh, miraculous violence, I love this one, against our enemies. Uh, when, you get, when you get the power of the Holy Spirit on your life, my friend, it's power. It, it's not some spiritual enigma. It's not some thing that floats around. There's a genuine spiritual energy that is released on us, in us, and through us. Are y'all with me this morning? I'm looking for some powerful people. This word power has three meanings. Or actually, this word power, the dunamis, we get three of our English words from it. And this gives us these three components. The first one is dynamic. Dynamic. If you look the word dynamic up, it's going to tell you it comes from the Greek word dynamis. You shall receive. I uh, See, I, I just got you. This is personal power. Just look at your person next to you and say, you're dynamic. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You're dynamic. You see, you, you can't. Be filled with the spirit of the living God and be dull. 
you're going to be dynamic. You are, my friend, dynamic. You don't have to try to be. You are. You don't have to take on somebody else's personality and say, they're dynamic, so if I act like them, I'll be dynamic. No. You just got to be who you are and let some super come on your natural, and you are going to become dynamic in the kingdom of God. You see, the Holy Spirit, this, this telling us here, the Holy Spirit gives us a divine ability to be. You shall receive power, and you shall be. You shall receive power, and you shall be. It's cause and effect. Receive power, and you shall be. Receive power, and you shall be. You see, many people think when you receive the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit on your life, that God enhances your gifts. No. God doesn't have to enhance your natural gifts. You can skill them on your own. But you have to understand when you are born again, you become a new creation in Christ Jesus. So God doesn't have to make my natural man dynamic. But when I am born again, I take on a new identity. I become a totally new creation. And this new creation needs new power. And so the baptism of the Holy Spirit is when the Holy Spirit comes upon me and I receive power to be. He says, witnesses unto me. The word witness is a martyr. A martyr is one that lays his life on the line. A martyr is one that says, I give myself totally to be a witness unto his glory. If I have to die, I'll die. But if I live, I guarantee you I'm going to live for him. I'm not going to live for him and be dead on the inside. I'm going to live for him, and I'm going to be dynamic. You see, when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, he doesn't enhance our natural ability, but he revolutionizes our identity in Christ. Oh, oh, I'm running out of time. You're, some of you are thinking he already ran out of time. Not quite. Hang on. You ain't got nowhere else to go. If you're pursuing, this is worth the wait. If you're playing, you're getting nervous right now. You define yourself. I don't have to. Watch. See, y'all look at me right now. But if you'd have known me when I was growing up, you would have never guessed I would be up here doing this. I know my, my dad's probably scratching his head. I don't know what to do with that boy. He ain't got no drive. He ain't got no sense. He's, I don't know what I'm going to do with that boy. I'm probably going to have to raise him. Because you, you, when you come to Christ, there's a new creation that comes alive on the inside of you that no one has ever seen until you are born again. And then when you get the Holy Spirit on that, something dynamic begins to develop in your life. And what's so cool about it is many times you don't see it, but people around you see it. You still look at the same guy in the mirror because you still deal with the same emotions and the same inadequacies and, 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 and all those other things that you had to deal with, all of us, if you're being real, that you have to deal with in life. And, and, and yet, yet when, you, when, when the anointing comes on you and the spirit comes on you, everybody looks at you and they say, man, they're dynamic. Man, they're, they're just got together. Man, they're just so awesome. They just, they, just, they just never have any problems. I know the devil's afraid of them. He never does anything to them. And you look at them and you think that. But you, you have to understand. You have to understand this, my friend, is, is, is a dunamis power. It causes us all to be dynamic in the realm that God has created us to be. Uh, oh, let me move on because this other one ties right in. And the other English word is dynamo. Dynamus, dynamo. Dynam it's, perpetual, it's perpetual power. You see, not only do we receive power to be, but we receive power to do. Yes, you receive power to be uh, who God has created you to be, but you also receive power uh, to do. And that's important because who we are determines what we do. So if I have the power of the Holy Spirit working on my life that helps me to be who God has created me to be, then I know for sure I will be able to do what he has called me to do. Are y'all understanding this? You, 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 you with me on this? You see, a new identity comes 
with new power. And then you actually are able to do destiny. Then you are actually able, I'm going to say it again, do destiny. Then you are actually able to do destiny. Destiny is bigger than you've ever dreamed, greater than you've ever thought. Destiny will place you in, in front of people of greatness. Destiny will cause you to be blessed. Destiny will move you into a realm that you will, you will see signs and wonders and miracles. But you can't get there on your own. But when the Spirit of God is upon you, He gives you power to be and power to do destiny. This, this, this is so important. Please understand my, my heart uh, t- today. I'm almost done, really. <sighs> Receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit does not make, uh, doesn't make me better. doesn't make you better than anyone else. It just makes me a better me. I don't know if anybody got that. That was sweet revelation right there. And you, know, you got this whole thing in the church. Well, I'm spirit filled and you're not. I'm better than you. Boo, that's religious. That's stupid. I'm not talking about trying to be better than somebody else. I'm talking about when the Holy Spirit comes on you, it gives you power to be and power to do, and it gives you the power to be the best you you can ever be. I'm not trying to compare myself with anybody else because there's a lot of great people. There's a lot of dynamic people in this room right now. There's a lot of powerful people in this room, and we don't have to compare ourselves with one another. I, yeah, it is a man, my, when I want the Holy Spirit in my life because when I receive power, I am able to be the best me that I can ever be. Oh, somebody shout yes. You see, why is that important? So you have to understand, again, we have an enemy. And the enemy, the enemy, my friend, the moment you have power to be, and the moment you have power to do, you become a threat to hell's limitation. And hell says, wait a minute, I can't let them get up. I can't let them stay up. I can't get there. I can't let them get into destiny. Because if they get into destiny, they're going to mess my plan up. They're going to mess me. I have a plan for them. I have a plan to tear them down. I have a plan to take them to hell. I have a plan to keep them, keep them small, keep them inactive and ineffective in their life. I have a plan to destroy them. But the moment you receive power from on high to be and to do, his plan of limitation is broken off your life. And there's absolutely nowhere and there's absolutely nothing that you can't do. I'm getting ready to release something over this house. The last word is dynamite. Dynamic, dynamo, dynamite. That's penetrating power. The reason he gave us power is that we will be able to explode through the limitation of the enemy. We become, I know, I hope this is offending anybody, but I got this this picture. We, We become like Holy Spirit terrorists. And I'm talking about like we're strapped with explosives. We're strapped with the gifts of the Spirit. We're strapped with the fruit of the Spirit. We're strapped. And so anytime we walk up into the territory of the enemy, I'm dangerous because I could explode at any moment. I could go off any moment. I could release a level of love that causes hate to bow. I can release a level of joy that causes oppression to run. I can release power. I can release anointing. I can go off any moment because the power he gives me ain't just for a Sunday morning, ain't just for a worship service. It's everywhere I go. When I march into the enemy's territory, when I have made up my mind, I'm going to be and I'm going to do, I become dangerous. And so the enemy has this game he plays. It's called fear. It's called intimidation. That's why he writes to his son in the faith in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. And he declares to him, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and of a sound mind. You see, I want you to understand this today. When you, when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you take a quantum leap into the power zone. And as you release that in your life and you, be, and you continue to grow in that and grow in the understanding of that, it creates in you a, a new person that is able to be 
and able to do. Hell fears us. Hell is afraid of us. But I, I want you to understand, when the spirit of fear comes, and the word fear there literally means intimidate, intimidation. He's taught, Paul is talking to his son Timothy. Timothy, God has not given you a spirit of intimidation. Do not be afraid to live boldly. Do not allow fear to cause you to shrink back. Timothy, you can do this. The spirit of fear, because fear is a spirit that has been sent. It is a limitating spirit that paralyzes what God wants to do over your life. I have come to release a thing in this room today. I have come to drive out the spirit of fear. And as Johannes prophesied Wednesday night, I have come to raise up a fearless generation. A generation that has the heart of a lion. A generation that has the heart of the lion of Judah. That bows before no one. Fears nothing. That's the only way you can live the life he's called you to live. You've got to live fearlessly. You've got to live full of faith. You've got to live full of power. Get up on your feet and shout yes. All right. We're going to move from the comfort zone to the power zone. Fear will make us powerless. Fear will make us passionateless. Fear will cause us to be purposeless in our life. When the Spirit of God comes upon us, whether that is a first time baptism in the Holy Spirit or that is a fresh baptism in the Holy Spirit, or that's just a power encounter. See, today some of y'all just need a power encounter. You just need God to rock you. See, how, how do you know that's going to happen? I just, I, I, don't, I don't, I just put my faith on it and ask God to do it. You just, I, see, I guess the rest up to us. You see, fear will cause us to live the less than life. But God's intention for his people is that we would live the life that is more than enough. So when the spirit of fear wraps itself around your life, it causes you to feel less than. Others can do that, but I can't. Others can go there, but I can't. Others can know God like that, but I can't. That's a little too spiritual for me, preacher. See, that's, that's, that's the spirit of fear. That's intimidation from the enemy to limit you. In just a moment, prophetically, we're going to move. And we're going to move from the comfort zone. Because that's where the enemy wants to keep us to the power zone and I want to speak over you today the word of the Lord that says you are dynamic you are a dynamo you are dynamite you my friend are powerful you are powerful Everywhere you go, things shift. Have you ever been around powerful people in the natural realm? They tell us that the, the most powerful person in America is the president of the United States. You know what happens? When he shows up somewhere, about 50 cars show up. Everywhere he shows up. Unless they intentionally do it in a way that nobody is supposed to know. When he shows up, everybody knows. I, I, I want you to know that God is wanting to release a people in the earth. He's wanting to raise up a church that when we show up, we don't, we don't, we, we're not sliding in, um, in, in some little hoopty.
was showing up ready to do business ready to do kingdom transaction and isn't it something that the thing that the devil fights the most in churches across this nation is people being filled with the Holy Spirit and speaking with that other, that other tongue why we just think it's out of, out, out of date no it's the enemy's strategy and plan to keep us small and to keep God small but if we release, receive and release, we move into a place of exaltation, a place of edification. We move into the power zone. I'm getting ready to do this. Corey, I've been watching your son. I see the presence of God all over you. Elder, walk him up here. I want him up here close. So I'm getting ready. I'm getting ready to make a call. I'm getting ready. Just stay right there, buddy. I know God's doing the work in your life. See, see, you, you don't know what I know about this young man right here. You don't know. Mark, go pray with him. You know him. This is a young man that's got a mark on his life, but, God, but the enemy's been trying to kill him his whole life. You just say, that's all right, man. That's called pursuit. That's called being desperate for change. That's called, I'm tired of the devil killing me. We can't be afraid around because God's getting ready to release hundreds like that. Jesus. All right. I'm going to count to three. I'm going to count to three. That's all right. He's just going through deliverance right now. Go stand with him. Just stand. Don't touch him. Just stand with him, Roger. Look at me. No, no, no. Look at me. God's going to do what God's going to do. Y'all look at me. I'm getting ready to move you. I'm serious, man. I'm getting ready to move you from, from the comfort zone to the power zone. It's as easy as taking a step of faith. It's easy as moving from your seat and moving to the front of this building. This is an altar. This is where we meet with God. This is where glory is poured out and fire falls. And the river rises right here. I'm going to count to three. Corey. Three, if you're ready to move, if you're ready to move from the comfort zone to the power zone, get ready, get ready, fresh start. Get ready. One, two.
Y'all don't worry about this young man. We got it. We got it. It's your moment. It's your moment. It's your moment. It's your moment. If you have your heavenly language, I want you to release it right now. Release. 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 If you've never received, by faith, receive. 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 Receive the glory, glory, glory.